foundation proposal meeting. Um, this is a series of weekly meetings with special guest Rune Christensen, who is going to be walking us through the foundation proposal document that we released a couple weeks ago. Uh, it's an extremely important document. I'm hoping that everybody has had a chance to read it. If you haven't, it's linked in the comments below. I've always wanted to do this. Um, and while you're there, please click subscribe. <laughs> what have I come to? All right, click subscribe and uh, do the little bell thing. Uh, if we get enough subscribers, we'll be able to rename our channel to something logical, and that would be awesome for us. Um, before we, we get it deep into things, I want to talk briefly about uh, a new meeting schedule that we've been talking about internally. There's a great deal of information that uh, we as a foundation need to go over and to understand uh, in advance of the uh, release of decentralized governance and before the release of multi-collateral DAI. And because of that volume of information, we all need to sort of become ad hoc experts in. But between now and then, we're going to be having three weekly meetings instead of one. The schedule has been posted to Reddit, but the plan right now is Tuesdays at 9 PST AM. We'll continue with our community meetings. We'll talk about general events, what the foundation has been up to, what kind of partnerships we have, uh, things like that. On Wednesdays, we'll be having proposal meetings uh, where we speak about anything related to sort of the overarching vision of the organization. We'll talk about uh, foundation proposal itself and the issues that can, are contained in there, like uh, sustainable finance, the 20% principle, uh, gradual decentralization. Those meetings are also at 9 a.m. on Wednesdays. Uh, on Thursdays, we'll be starting a new series of meetings. Uh, the first one will be tomorrow with a special guest, uh, recurring guest, almost a co-host at this point, um, Stephen Becker, who's our head of risk. And he will be helping us all get ramped up on the sort of the complexities around scientific governance and the risk framework that the, the risk teams have been working on. So we can all understand how we're going to do governance, what that governance is going to look like for MakerDAO, and talk about how we onboard collateral and, and dealing with some of the, the finer points of what risk actually means, which which is going to be a significant amount of, of information to absorb. So hoping to see everybody there as well, if your interests align with that, uh, Thursdays at 9 a.m. PST. That's my plug. I think mm -hmm. that we should just jump into it. We have a nice cozy crowd today. So uh, my name is Richard Brown. I'm the technical community manager at MakerDAO. Jess, do you want to introduce yourself? Hey, how's it going? I, I'm Jess, and I'm an events and community manager. Um, and I'm happy to read off your questions as they come into the chat. Yeah, great point. So if anybody has something that a burning question that needs to be answered, feel free to pipe up in, with uh, voice or uh, type your your question in chat and Jess will be monitoring that and she'll make sure that you're heard. Rune, do you wanna introduce yourself and tell us what you do at MakerDAO? Hey everyone, I'm Rune Christensen and I'm the co-founder of MakerDAO and the CEO of the Maker Foundation. That about covers it, I think. <laughs> um, so the, the last few meetings that we've had have been primarily focused with exploring some issues around the 20% principle, which uh, it is complex. There's a lot of nuances there. There's, there's. I think there's going to be more con conversations to be had. But uh, and, and we still have a few questions remaining. Rune, did you want to give us a brief overview just to set the stage of what the twenty percent principle is about, and then we can talk about those questions? Yes. So, um, so the twenty percent principle is the commitment from the foundation as a part of the foundation proposal that. Um, we want to basically allocate, I guess you can say 20% of the value of the maker system overall to charity, or more specifically like the surplus that the system will earn over time should go to charity um, under the governance of NPR holders. And this is basically, I mean, from on one hand, it's a, it's a great way to like showcase the power of DAI as a, just like a tool for distributing money directly to people it's kind of like a way to ensure um, like a lot of growth and adoption basically and can and in a sense can even be seen as just like marketing and uh, adoption efforts um, it's also just like PR and like establishing a brand as like this completely new paradigm in finance where it's actually not greedy bankers it's actually 
you know, like um, trustworthy people, like safeguarding the fundamental infrastructure that makes society worth work and, and doing so with like a very um, strong set of moral principles. Um, and then it's also just like a, an advantage to basically to like politics and regulators, right? In particular, where, which is something, like it's a type of stakeholder that makers insanely uh, uh, very uh, exposed to, you know, like it's like, like compared to mo like most crypto projects usually have some interaction with regulators in relation to something they do, such as there are, if they did an ICO or something or like some other particular thing they did. But, but makers different because we rely on strong partnerships with authorities to enforce our our claims and collateral in the system, right? Like so, fundamentally, Maker is is a project that that relies on the existing uh, legal and and regulatory and political infrastructure of the world. So it's just there's just like a different level of um, of uh, sort of partnership we need with with the the authorities, basically, and and that's again like that's just doing charity and like doing it in a in a convincing way. That's you know, obviously, um, done for the you know, like for the sake of actually being like a good actor in the world, and uh, and not just like protecting a brand and then you know, like hedging, like doing some some shady stuff and then hedging by doing some charity or something, right? Like, but rather trying to make it a core of what we are. That that is like one of the strongest and most convincing sort of arguments and powers that that will help us break through in terms of partnership with authorities. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point, and you've you've raised that before, which I think that a lot of our our, our holders are kind of they find that kind of compelling, and I, I do too. So there there's the straight up app, a practical application of creating relationships with local regulators, being seen as a good actor. So it's yeah, there's business utility in doing good from this perspective, but there's also the flip side of that is it's not a completely um, sort of uh, uh, cynical uh, exercise. It's we we have this very strong focus on actually doing good in the world as well. It's sort of baked into our DNA, which it's an interesting yeah. point to stress. So, it, when it comes to dealing, or at least creating relationships with local regulators or local governments, will that be will that factor into the the charities or the humanitarian efforts that we focus on? Will we look to specific geopolitical implications or relationships that can be sort of fostered by picking one uh, one fund over another? So, I mean, ultimately, MKL holders make the final decisions, everything like this, right? But I, I absolutely think that there is, I mean, it's, it's, it's and it, especially seen in light of this, of course, is also justified as being an, an exercise in, in promoting adoption and growth of diet, right? So I think there absolutely is an opportunity to make, you know, to ensure that that the stars align in terms of we 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 do our charity and we distribute die or like support uh, charitable or whatever infrastructure in areas that that use die in some way, where we also happen to to have like a, a good regulatory relationship or the potential for a good partnership there and sort of a deeper. Um, what it, you know, a deeper penetration of the the society, and then being able to add on top, like as a cherry on top, like this, like at, like actual show of of obviously again, like fundamentally has to be non cynical, but actually uh, earnest charity and earnest like efforts done that just to show basically, look, we want to help, and like we're good, we're good guys, kind of, and we're doing the you know, and that's a primary reason it's because we we are good guys, and we want you guys to. To think of us as good guys, and if we're sort of completely honest about that, we really have a you know it's just like it's just like an extra thing we bring to the table in terms of the kind of like long-lasting partnerships we can make on you know on like a I mean on a societal basis, right? I mean this is something I talked about before, right? In terms of the social contract, I mean if we're if we're sort of going out and and trying to to market to an entire people of an of a whole country, that's like a very uh, delicate situation to be in, right? And you sort of need every single card you have available if you want to actually be able to both like, like beat the competitors in the marketplace and also win the people's hearts and sort of actually be seen as, as a, not really a contender in the marketplace, but actually 
like a saver from the heavens in a sense, right? I mean, um, almost, right? I mean, in terms of how we are like changing things completely um, uh, and how we have a vision for the future where finance and markets and so on just have like a, a more like, yeah, you know, like a, a completely different approach. So that is, but, but these, so these are all the advantages, like all the arguments that what I call like external arguments. So basically all these like, I mean, ultimately in a sense, you can consider like cynical reasons for why it's profitable Charity, right because they're really like justifications for if we spend 20 percent of our surplus on charity we can actually expect to get value that is greater than 20 percent of our surplus if, if we or, or or if we had just like distributely you know just let it go to buy and burn or if we use it in something else actually turns out that credibly committing to charity is actually a, like a legitimate business strategy um, yeah, but there's also the other side. Yeah, there's also right. yeah. There, I mean, so there's also there's also other side to the coin, right? Which is what I call the internal argument. So basically, um, the like, and which I actually believe on the stronger the stronger argument, which is actually that fundamentally, um, for maker to sort of function, like for the com for the maker community, um, and. Um, and the, the community spirit and sort of the the people, like I mean, not just the people who are involved now, but especially the fact that we want to be able to onboard people into our community in sizes that are, you know, like we want to be able to confidently open up and let in a hundred thousand people. If we and, and we're probably something like five thousand people right now, so you know, we we'd have twenty new guys for every old guy, every one old guy, and we want to be absolutely sure that. The, the principles and the, the community spirit and sort of the moral standards and, and uh, thinking patterns that we've built up very strongly like imprint themselves on the new guys and and uh, and not that we don't want to learn anything new or get new inputs in but we sort of want to make we, we, we sort of want to assume that we already have a good idea of what we're doing and sort of that what we already build up is is the right path right I mean because that's a goal with the situation we're currently in, we're still flexible enough to actually set out the path, and then we want to make sure that the path we take is is one that is so, like you know, like like really makes sense, like self-evident and strong that it really becomes like a shelling point where it's like this, you know people will sort of be able to to just like identify and and gather around this path we're going, which is like this better finance, right? That's just like better in every aspect. Um, so that's, that's part of the, the, the reasoning behind these these weekly meetings is to help set that tone and create the those the cultural consensus or evolve it over time for when the, the herd arrives there will be something established. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, also, I mean, that's why it's great that I keep repeating these arguments. That I mean, I've, I've been saying this every time at the past the past meetings like this, right? Because ultimately, the idea is that these arguments and this type of thinking should spread out in the community and go from community member to new community member and then well I mean and then so the internal argument basically is if these new people I mean the, let's say the outsider who comes in and he is he's he is uh, brought into our our mind space right like he's brought into our way of thinking and he internalizes 20 percent of charity that's great like I mean that's a good thing and I feel feel good about it and that will actually result in him being a better governor of the system. Like it will some result in him being more likely to output useful scientific governance for the um, for the scientific framework. And 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 the, the the main link here between like what, like why that should be better is basically that like the scientific like the pursuit of science itself and and scientific consensus and scientific process is fundamentally something that is not, you know, like it is not profit motivated, right? Like fundamentally, like it is something that is, um, I mean, you could say altruistic, but maybe that's a, like, that's a word that's loaded in a, in a slightly different way, but it's also just like, it is, I guess another, another way to call it be constructive, right? Like you, you participate in, in science and sort of you, you contribute something um, to a scientific community because you want to, I mean, you want to achieve something, right? You want to, you want to help construct, you want to help bring something good into the world. And like it is, and this is then what we, what we keep coming back to, right? There is actually also going to be a class of actor potentially like out there in the, in the dark depths of the crypto economic landscape 
um, that will that could potentially participate in governance without this mindset. And the the alternative is the mindset where you participate in governance for your own sake, um, which is also you know like tragedy of the commons, um, prisoners dilemma, whatever you want to call it. Right? I mean, it's all game theory. Sure, um, but that you're says saying that, the sort of this this formulated for a formalized scientific governance, so a framework that requires uh, logical inputs and modeling of the actual results sort of eliminates uh, opportunities for shady game theoretical maneuvering. It forces people to prove their assumptions and saying, instead of trying to you know, like bamboozle the, the community by claiming that one outcome will result from this proposal, they actually need to prove it. So you're creating some kind of transparency and reproducibility in the scientific governance process, but also in, in the charitable giving process as well. Yeah, so so and this is a really important point, right? Like, so the scientific framework itself is designed exactly like this, right? It's the, it's, the point is to try to like minimize the opportunities for bias in the, in the decisions of governance. But ultimately, and this is a really important point, this is not a solvable problem. Like, it's not possible to design a process that fundamentally eliminates bias and reaches objective truth. Um, unfortunately, and that's why, I mean, we can get very far with the scientific framework, but the final stretch, like the last mile, that's where, well, abundance mentality is important, right? Like, that's where the spirit of giving and, like, the spirit of we want to support charity because we're actually in this stuff, not just to make money or not just for selfish gain, but for building a better world and, uh, you know, making everything awesome. Yeah, that's, um, that's interesting. Tragedy of the Commons is, is an often repeated uh, uh, parable, but I think that that's it's primarily what we're all about, or one of, one of the primary risks to, to the maker ecosystem, right? We uh, People are coming in for a short-term game that might not be uh, looking for the, towards the long-term st 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 stability, sorry, of our organization, we need to be able to identify those kinds of actors and the, the scientific governance process will help sort of uncover that. Uh, the long term results are. Yeah, um, David actually asked an interesting question, um, a bit alternative to that. Uh, if we would consider opening an option for organizations to match the MakerDAO charity contributions, um, and he follows whether or not that might be a way that institutions could influence money to be granted to their own initiatives. Yeah, I mean, so so this is so um, this is absolutely like so there's kind of the two two things to this, right? I mean, in the short term, the foundation is actually going to contribute to charity beyond the twenty percent principle, and this will be in, like this will be very strongly with these like business development goals in mind, where it's all about like partnering and branding together with the right guys and like supporting initiatives that really make sense in like a short term strategic sense. Um, and absolutely, I think that's also something that the 20% principle should be used for, right? It's like also about, like it's not just about like creating unity and creating like shared, um, like shared community spirit within our community, but also doing so with the other good actors out in the real world that we identify as, as being legit and the kind of, the kind of companies that we want to see you know, be the ones building the new world, right? And um, and yeah, I mean, I think absolutely always like that. I mean, my hope is that the 20% principle will be something that it is applied in a way that sort of, you know, that is like self-sustainable in the sense that like it does, it, it, it from a business point of view, it, it, it makes sense the way we use it. But fundamentally it is, it is like sort of, like it is altruistic fundamentally, right? Like, I mean, and that's kind of like an important thing because only then do we get these like spiritual benefits from it, right? I mean, if it turns into something cynical, then in fact it is point like it's kind of at that point you're it, it's it's a marketing budget in a sense, right? And there and that's what's very important. It should not become right. It should be like this thing that that uh, ultimately becomes like the safeguard of the whole like maker governance ethos of like if you're a maker governor, ultimately you're you are, you know, you are personally committed to help the stability of DAI and by extension, uh, the world in a sense, right? And like, and from there, you know, you sort of, you know, when you look at, at, at the future of, of the interconnectedness of the world and things like, com like companies of the future, depths of the future, communities of the future, 
it's just it's just increasingly clear that everything is so connected that um yeah i mean just like it, charity doing doing charity and doing business is closer to each other than you think um and it's just like very much possible to be sort of a what do you call it, like a red-blooded businessman you know winning in the market and at the same time also be an altruist that works towards a, a common good and uh, and just like helps the world in a way that like that you know that just compared to what how how resources currently are allocated right like it doesn't really take that much to really dramatically change um just like you know change the world for those who are underprivileged and in a in an unlucky situation but so there's a there's a point i want to get back to and that is um this uh, like i mean the abundance mentality and like this mindset of selfishness versus altruism in in the context of risk governance um, and that is, I think, the primary driver of tragedy of the commons, right? It's really uh, actually a network effect, I would say, right? And corruption in general is like, the question is, are your peers, are they, you know, if, you have, if you're making a decision of whether you want to be corrupt, right? You prim the primary thing that drives the decision with yourself is whether or not the other people are corrupt, like those around you. Because if everyone else is like getting money under the table or like voting for their own coins, why should you like stand out as this like shining example of naivety when everyone else is profiting and you're not, right? Um, but on the other hand, if it, if it goes the other way, if everyone else has this like abundance mentality and like this this belief that they already have enough, things are already great, right? Like they already have MKR and it's going and the system is stable and it's growing and it's growing great. Like they don't need more, you know. They don't need excessive gains. They just need you know like great great value, right? And, and they actually gain more from then also getting spiritual fulfillment, basically. Not just, and, and also just they sort of have this, and this is again kind of what the point of the 20% principle is, right? They also have this, like, I, mean, I would call faith, basically, that ultimately this is just better for the long run. I mean, there are just advantages to this we can't even really identify, but we just know it's, the, it's just a good thing to do. And, and yeah. what comes around goes around in a sense, right? Yeah, I, I agree with you personally um, that that's probably the case, but th it's how to make that happen. I think that it, where things get complex and, and we can have meetings to talk about what the general tone is and the feeling is, and we can have uh, like stuff on medium about the foundation proposal and principles, but how do we actually bake those kind of safeguards into the, the DNA of MakerDAO specifically? Is it, will we is, is it just a matter of measuring like negative externalities and like having that as a part of a framework for evaluation is it a cultural kind of let's hey everybody let's chat about this proposal which i think might be bad or good how, how do we make sure that this kind of stuff doesn't get co-opted or diluted over time so i mean i think now you're talking about sustainable like how do we ensure that so sort of the sustainable finance principle right how do we ensure that the the risk function and like the maker governance doesn't like impact the world negatively in some way by um funding stuff that then poses an existential risk or, or something right to the world but i mean what my answer to that is that's a 20 percent principle like that's where it sort of starts because and and what and specifically what how do we make the 20 percent principle a reality right it's very simple first um everyone who has a, a problem with it i guess right people who are skeptical about it fundamentally like keep bringing up you know basically like you know like debate with me to death basically their specific issues and and me and sort of other people keep attending to like you know like it's you know convince them that ultimately it's just like even even if you're 100 percent selfish it's still in your best interest to support this at this point because you know it's like it's about the unity of the the community at that point right like um and you're still gonna be i mean like the, the, the resistance to giving out charity should be based in desire for um, like a self-interest, right? And sort of like a, a belief that why should I give it? Like, I don't know anyone else, anything that's, you know, why shouldn't I get that money? Right. But if you're, if you can sort of, if it's clear that at this point we're talking about, like we can achieve like a, a level of community unity that we wouldn't be able to otherwise achieve. And that actually helps us credibly, God against long-term issues such as the tragedy of the commons. 
So breaking it into the framework itself, saying that like these are the, you know, this is the long tail benefits for the ecosystem or for MakerDAO itself to be involved with this, this charitable organization um, and, and sort of presenting that as a business case, not just uh, a moral or ethical sort of case. Well, I mean, yes, but, but I would say like, it's this, but yes, but it's, it's really about, I mean, fundamentally, this is about putting it into, it's not just building it into the foundation Proposing things, it's right. It's about building it into the the minds of the people in the community, and ultimately make people just realize that this is something that they themselves care about and benefit from. And at that point, it will be like I mean, once it's there, and once this critical mass of an abundant, you know, abundance mentality of uh, altruism in the community, it's just it, you know, it's not you. You once you have it, like it, you know how it works on Reddit, right? Once Reddit makes a decision on uh, which president candidate to support or something, then that's a guy, I mean, then the decision is made and that's now what Reddit thinks and who they identify as. Um, and that's the same thing, I mean, that's what I want to achieve with Maker, is that Maker becomes so strongly like, uh, you know, like altruistically, uh, absolutely good, you know, like good to the core, to the point where it just never should be possible for the community to corrupt, because it's just like, it's just like a fundamental, I mean, it's like the fundamental part of the community, really, right? Um, I think there might be then, a yeah. lesson there because we, we've seen subreddits go south in the past and it's, it's part of maintaining this cultural uh, management or at least reinforcing core principles. Yeah, and that's actually where I think, and that's what I also consider to be like, what I think is very cool about 20th principle, right? Is that it's not just something we vote in now and then we're like, okay, now we are, charitists and we do charity all the time I'm like now we you know now we do charity it's actually the, the point is also that not only will the community consciously make a decision to sort of unite around supporting charity and and um and like sort of uh yeah, you know like stressing the importance of altruism and selfishness selflessness in large-scale uh you know economic collaboration but we will also have uh, like get our, you know, we will also be have the whole charity as sort of the thing that that brings us together regularly because we will be constantly managing it together, right? And it will be sort of the alongside the risk governance, it will be the place where we basically, you know, sort of exercise being being a part of Maker, right? Like it will be sort of a fundamental activity of what you do, and that's the thing. Like that gives us something that sort of every time we do that activity, we are reinforcing who we are, right? And we're reinforcing this identity of altruism, do things right, uh, be the good guys, yeah, that then perfect. also permeate into the risk assessment again, right? And like sort of help us on the risk management part. I think that's okay. interesting. I think that one of the things that it aligns with our new meeting schedule is that we're gonna be attracting different demographics of people and, and perhaps the scientific governance uh, risk framework people will gravitate to Thursdays and that let's do good in the world people might gravitate to the Wednesday meetings. Um, we've been chatting for a half hour and we haven't gotten to any questions yet. So um, um, let's focus on some. Jess, you can read out from the chats. And then after that, I'm going to uh, catch up on some questions that have been asked on Reddit. Sure. So Aviv actually asked uh, some interesting questions on the subject of uh, who those audience would be. Um, first, he asked who uses DAI. What is the target audience following up? Yes, what charitable work will motivate that person to use DAI? And third, um, he asked, do you think a charitable act will be more effective if it adds benefit to the world as a whole or if it targets the user base specifically? Uh, so that, yeah, those are great questions. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, so, there are people right now in in like conflict zones that actually receive like they receive cash that has been like sourced there through DAI. Um, this is through Project Bifrost, right? That we recently um, announced. So there are actually right now like this um, just like an example of charitable, uh, you know, like solution using DAI and actually helping people on the ground getting cash. And the big advantage is that. Because they're using, like, because this charity uh, is using DAI to deliver the cash to the, the end recipient, they are finally able to circumvent a financial blockade that has been, been uh, put in place around this area. 
And unfortunately, we can't, like, we are under a very strict NDA uh, due for the sake of the security of people who are involved in this. So we can't actually talk about any details. But I just wanted to say that there, there's actually something real happening right now using DAI to sort of uh, achieve these charitable goals. But to more to the question of who's using it right now, that's sort of relevant for this. So I'm just going to, like, after this example of, a, like, after this real world example, I'll actually come up with, like, a, you know, like a made up example of who's going to use DAI very soon, right? And that would be something like, um, uh, let's say Ghana is a really good example, right? Like Ghana is a country where there's actually plenty of uh, smartphones and it's kind of like, it's not, it's not going terribly bad there. Um, and uh, th yeah, I mean, there's a, like this economy going, there's actually like real like business opportunities there. And there is like a relatively good uh, smartphone uh, penetration. And so you will have people, and but what there isn't is like there's terrible financial infrastructure, right? Like nobody's got bank accounts. Uh, I mean, if you get, you know, like the banks don't really care about the the regular people there at all, right? So, so you have this problem of like cash, cash holding and cash under the pillow and in the pillow and that kind of stuff. And these people will just they will use that like just as a safe. I mean, instead of holding a bunch of cash that can be stolen. They'll hold the die in the smartphone and then have like, you know, like a cold wallet backup and just like you be able to like accept, accept, like access more secure, um, it's like really basic banking, banking uh, service needs. And then from there also like build up into more advanced stuff, right? Like they can actually get access to financial services. They can even like invest in, in you know, like in, in, in the, just like in a portfolio that helps them grow their wealth over time. They'll be able to do stuff like multi six, so suddenly they can create companies. Um, there's all these things. I mean, looking at, at, at an unbanked area, like like uh, many areas in in sub-Saharan countries, it's just like you can look at anything, and you will just be you know like it's so easy to to explain exactly how Dai and blockchain is going to dramatically change that, right? Like for individuals in terms of savings, for companies in terms of being able to actually. Um, you know, like pool money together and not have one guy run away with all the cash. Uh, and then for payments, obviously transactions, I mean, remittance, all that stuff. It's just such a, like th the use case there is just going to be so much harder. So anyway, so now we, we, we're talking about that, right? We're talking about like sub-Saharan country where people are using that, right? Like then let's, let's bring, um, like let's, let's think about how we can, we can like rapidly, um, just like improve that, even like the use case is already there, but how can we like rapidly ensure, like see adoption and just like see, you know, like a, like a type of like exponential growth and critical mass that, you know, that goes beyond just like people, you know, um, you know, it, adopting it kind of on their own, right? Like build it and they will come style. So, ima like, so, so imagine something like, a charity we're already working with, like so we're doing the twenties in principle we are we're donating to various charitable institutions um, a charity that we're already working with a trust basically comes to us and say okay there's this community like these like uh, ten villages that have like um, like they're doing subsistence agriculture uh, but there's actually a lot of potential they just need like like there's been like a draw recently or whatever there's some reason why right now like um, they're not able to like they're sort of there's, there's like a negative spiral going on. There's like a, whatever disease or something like just like a number of, of issues that really, if all of this, if they could just like get a chance, basically, you would actually, you could see these people get into what I would call like a positive spiral, right? Like rather than a negative spiral, right? like you'd see them like be able to actually grow themselves out of in, into like a better situation. So we could actually just get a list like a list of Ethereum accounts that represents every one of these persons one to one, and then use like use an identity verification system that could be, for instance, come to regular the charity or something like that, right? And we could we could just have like maker holders authorize, you know, like basic income to these people directly, um, you know, on like I mean, just to that literally that list of accounts that we have on them. So so the the governance is literally like we we're choosing and like. A list of people that we sort of know, um, and sending money to register them, and there's no like there's no charity involved, there's no nothing, right? Like it's people receiving money to register their smartphones, and then us 
following up, ensuring, getting evidence that yes, this is exactly what's happening. There's like the fraud rate near zero, right? Like the any like funds getting diverted or frozen or something that can't even happen. It's literally impossible. Um, yeah. So what like is this going to be effective? Well, that's where, basically where I think. I mean, this kind of scenario, this is kind of like the dream scenario we're talking about here, right? Like where then they start getting this basic income. It, it results in them like being able to overcome their really short-term problems. Um, and it also just like, I mean, it gives, gives them like the boost to actually begin working towards, like working on, on their long-term issues, which is like, let's, you know, improve our infrastructure. And uh, there's this really nice data already that, um, even though, I mean, many people would naturally assume that if you, you know, like, let's say you, if you give money to an alcoholic, right, he's going to like buy more beer or something, right? He's not going to use that to fix his life, right? And that logic, something like could maybe be applied to something like, you know, people who are on the, on the brink of starvation or something. But it turns out that in reality, that's not the case. Like, if you're like unbanked or like underprivileged and just like, in, like poor and you're given money, like, because the, 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 the seriousness of your situation, when you actually know that people can you know, like people in your situation could literally starve to death, um, apparently just compels like the really poor people to absolutely like try to rationally maximize their, that, you know, like uh, the outcomes of the decisions in that scenario. And that's, I mean, if they, if they know that it's not a one-off donation as well, right? If there's some kind of schedule involved, they know that they can invest in their future. Yeah, but even with the one, I mean, I'm, my my favorite uh, study is actually based on a one-off donation, where the the rate, I I believe it was ninety-seven percent uh, of the people, I think they received, I think they received a hundred dollars each, and then ninety-seven percent of them used that money. In fact, I think it was less than hundred dollars, but ninety-seven percent of them used that money for the the economic economically optimal um, thing they could do, which apparently is to buy a metal roof because. Uh, like metal roofs is like a, a big sunk cost up front, but then uh, like straw roofs or like other types of roofs, they need to be constantly replaced and actually become a much bigger expense over time. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, so if we if we if we do that, we already are like sort of you know we're creating like hope and like creating an opportunity that now things can improve here, right? And then I mean, the next step is. Once we're already doing charity and once you're already engaging here and you're sort of doing it on a very individual basis, right? Where it's literally like the maker hive mind choosing these people like personally, directly, and giving them money directly. The next step is we can, you know, we can, uh, we can do more than just that, right? Like we can do stuff like, so now you have an app on your phone that, um, you know, that gives you, that, that, you know, gives you money every day. You know, here's, here's like, a number of apps you can use to like, I don't know, like learn how to farm better or get work online, right? Like learn, train, get a job training, you know, training data sets for, for AIs or something. Um, just like, you know, if we have people who are actually motivate, like human beings and they're, they're motivated and they're, you know, they, they, they're in a very cheap area, right? Like where it doesn't really take much to like actually see a big change in your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Um, we just, I mean, it's just like, you know, potential basically that can be, that can be built up. Um, and then let's just like, I mean, fast forward 20 years or 30 years from when we initially start doing this, right? Like at some point we will reach the break even in, uh, in what at this point, which I would, you know, think of as becoming an economic zone, right? Like a, like a special die economic zone where everyone's receiving die basic income all everything happens with die right i mean it's literally like a complete network you created here with uh you know where it's just like it's like not only is it improving their um their opportunities in terms of how like the financial infrastructure they have access to but also it like changes their just like their worldview because being like being in like a true die economy is kind of like being together with the whole world right like because you have this like new and seamless you know, system you live in, that's actually where everyone are, are like fully connected, right? And I mean, eventually, because I mean, just, you know, like if you have, if you have stability and you have growth and you have time, eventually you get actual, you know, proper economics, right? Like a, a real economy. Okay. Um, we're, we're coming up on the 15 minute mark left. 
I'd really love to get to some of the questions we had outstanding for the last couple of weeks. So that's yeah, I think this amazing. is a good. This, I, I believe at this point, I mean, this this was like an external argument again, right? And I think basically this has been covered really well. Um, for the outstanding arguments, I think mostly they are related to the internal argument, right? Like, well, sorry, the outstanding questions. So uh, yeah. So uh, uh, Jay Pritikin asked a question. I, I'm not sure that we've actually touched on this before in this uh, venue, but the question is, what if the vote is held to accept the 20% principle and the proposal is rejected? What do we do then? Well, I mean, then we make a new proposal. Um, <laughs> but in general, I mean, I think so. So, I mean, our thinking about this proposal, right, is that, and kind of the point of this is that we want to showcase, I mean, we already know that in the community, there's just like a very strong backing around the, the, the team on the foundation, right? Like and generally like a, a trust in the, in our leadership and sort of our, yeah, like our thought leadership on, on how to, to bootstrap a DAO like this and so on, right? Like, so um, I like a part of that naturally also is that we, we believe that the community, like, because we, we actually have been internally convinced that, um, you know, like the 20% principle is basically the solution to one of our fundamental problems, the tragedy of the commons, right? Um, and I think that, like having the like foundation proposal rejected um, for whatever reason, I mean, that could be the 20% principle or something else, right? Um, getting that rejected is more than just, you know, I mean, that it fundamentally means that we in the foundation have to change our assumptions around our role in the community and whether or not we even, you know, um, are doing what's best for the project, right? Like, and best for the community in this, in the, like, in the spirit of, of the fact that this, the whole point of this is to create something that's, like, number one, most importantly, is extremely decentralized, but number two also is based on strong consensus, right? Like unity, um, and and uh, right, like like again, like a scientific community, right? Like you have a incredibly diverse and broad group of people from all over the world, but ultimately we agree on certain fundamental principles that allows us to actually align on almost everything and and achieve something very like achieve something very real with because we have such a, a strong level of alignment. So basically, what I'm saying is. If the foundation proposal fails, that is kind of like, I mean, that's a very strong signal to the foundation to do stuff like sort of um, like rethink our, you know, our role in the community and uh, whether whether we should, tr you know, be leading it as strongly as we are. And uh, it's like, it's a shame we, <laughs> we spent so much time now. But I mean, I also wanted to touch a bit on gradual decentralization and the strong market focus, which kind of like is the other side of the coin of the charity question that we haven't even touched on. Um, but yeah, so I mean, so ultimately, like, if the foundation proposal fails, there has to be another one, right? Like, so there will be a revised one, and that could be stuff like removing the twenty percent principle, um, and and other things as well. But but also, I think in a in like in a big scale, like in a big way, it will result in like the foundation dramatically changing, uh, and and probably like sort of reducing its role, right? Um, and st essentially stepping back and uh, just like opening up for the community to to sit, take over the reins immediately rather than through this like gradual process uh, on, a, on a more like guided path, which ultimately like, Maker is such a powerful system that the community, if the community is like smart enough to control it, it can fully achieve everything it wants to, right? Like Maker can do stuff like funding anything it wants to fund, right? Like. Um, not just with the debt fund, but like directly from the system. Like it can use fees to fund things, like fund expenses, like oracles, but also stuff like business development, marketing, and all this stuff that the foundation is sort of taking on right now. Right. So um, that is like a viable path forward for Maker. But it's, I mean, personally, it's not something I think will happen. Right. Like I think, you know, people will see like, well, obviously, like they, you know, like people are, like support who we are and what we stand for and like our our belief in the future. Um, and also to see that this the, the, the situation, the position we're in right now, as long as we have this extremely strong and uh, and sort of unified community backing to what we do, means that we we are at the you know we're standing at the brink of like 
really like rapid expansion and rapid growth of the ecosystem, right? And like extreme, um, like very high levels of success in the in the blockchain space, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think even for even for people who, for instance, are like very much on the fence uh, on charity, the the you know like can still see the value of just like how powerful the the foundation team is and what that can what that can mean for Maker. Okay, um, yeah. we're coming up on ten minutes left, so I really want to make sure we focus on some questions. So, Jess, did you have another one? Before we move on. Yeah, I did. Um, so somewhat related to that, David had commented earlier that he thought it would be worth considering an informal registration to just vaguely identify the MKR voters who intended to participate. And um, was wondering if you had any comments on that. Um, he said a bit further that it would be something like an email uh, with a description of essentially how much MKR they had would we find utility in doing such a thing or would that give up anonymity you mean like for people for help voters with with voting by reminding them to vote uh or david would you want to clarify your question at all are you still on yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, I mean, uh, actually, Aviv made a good point in the chat that uh, that Reddit already kind of functions like that. But so does the Slack, since you know anybody that really does intend to vote, if they're already going to be, you know, if we're if, if something like an informal registration is going to be pushed, where they don't have to put any information they don't want to, but it would be sort of like, I don't know, just a centralized list of like getting an idea of who's voting. But I think that. Uh, there's just so many different places where voters can already connect. So I, I don't, yeah, I kind of take back that question because <laughs> I, I thought it through a little bit more. Okay, Rune, did you want to move on to sustainable finance or gradual decentralization today? Or do you want to continue addressing the 20% principle questions? So I, there's one question that I want to, uh, at, like, I mean, there's actually two I would have liked to respond to. Uh, on the on the Reddit post for the last foundation meeting, but um, I will focus on just one of them because I think that one is like very is very crucial. And w basically, what it is is like focusing on the internal argument, right? So what it's saying is uh, the tw and it's by N K Pine. Um, so what he's saying is the twenty percent principle may not shift the community culture research rigor in the ways that it was intense because it doesn't change the incentive for MPI holders, right? So like, you know, like, right? So basically he's saying, MPI holders still have the same incentives. So doing charity or not is not gonna change anything, right? Because no matter what, they will vote according to the incentive. Well, I'm like, yeah, because we're not changing the incentives. And basically my, I mean, and also like, it's seven five minutes, right? Like, um, Shifting 200K MKR from development purposes to charity doesn't directly impact the cost benefit analysis of pursuing MKR appreciation through responsible governance versus seeking short term gains by voting your own book. And, um, and, and that's totally true. Um, but the, the point is actually not to, I mean, and we, we realize that completely, of course, right? Um, but the point is actually to try to build a community of people. Who fundamentally, you know, like who do not operate according to the cost-benefit analysis when it comes to something as important as maker governance, because they, like, I mean, out of principle, right? Like, basically, like, because the identity of being a part of the maker community and being like a being a maker, right? Like, being being someone who potentially will end up safeguarding the global economy, right? Is you know, it's just not a, like a pursuit of like it's not a right like a profit a pursuit of profit right like it is primarily about stability and and you know, upholding stability it's not about like um like and as a result of upholding stability then getting payment like earning earning from that right um but not the other way around because thinking at it thinking about it the other way around just i mean people absolutely can and will but fundamentally that is not something that like it's not possible to create a system that sort of is able to survive in that kind of environment where you actually have people legitimately uh, weighing the the value of uh, I mean where you have like a, I guess you can say critical mass of people um, you know 
entirely looking at it from a cost benefit point of view. And that's basically because, unfortunately, um, the, 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 the cost benefit analysis of, uh, of voting is just pretty much no matter what is in uh, like voting your own book, basically. Um, like no matter what we do, it's just like, and, and, and it's, it's particular, it's the more everyone else are being good, the, the more likely, like the, like the less, like the more advantage you get from voting your own book and the less disadvantage you get from it. Um, so it's a problem we're always going to deal with. And our main, like, yeah, like the, the goal is not to try to change the cost benefit analysis. The goal is to like change the mind fed, mindset that a cost benefit analysis is how you, you, you should make your decision. Well, I mean, and let me, let me clarify that and saying a monetary cost benefit analysis, right? Because I mean, Kind of what I'm and what I've been saying a little bit earlier, but maybe a better way to say it is that the point is also to like inject this, and this is what also comes back to the abundance mentality, right? Like inject, you know, this additional notion of value, which is actually just doing good, right? And like if you both take your monetary gains into account, but also your spiritual gains, I guess you can say, right? Like your personal uh, gains, right? You're just always a hundred times better off going with your consciousness conscience right and like voting the, the i guess the objective way right like the, well the wholesome way i guess so that's actually really good like i mean there there like it's actually hard to find good words to explain this because like altruism for instance is like a word that can have some like sort of it just like naturally have like a an ulterior sound to it like you're saying altruism and then actually you're you know you're like tricking everyone um, right and yeah, like wholesome is actually a great word because that sort of cannot possibly be uh, um, like construed negatively, right? So yeah, I mean, it's about like it's about like wholesome voting being the absolute, absolute like best choice as an Gelder. and you'll be you'll be richer and you'll be happier, right? And you'll like get to see the impact you do on the world with your own eyes, either on the blockchain because you can like see the transactions, like go there and you can follow them around as their the economy and network builds up in real time before your eyes. Or you can, I mean, and this is be really a big part of the whole chip, like all our efforts, right, would be to actually go and get on the ground and like show how people are using DAI in, in the real world. You know, people who formerly didn't have access to banks, maybe didn't have cash, had to like trade with goats or something. Suddenly now they're in like the 21st century sending payments with their phones, right, and like crowdfunding, uh, sanitation upgrades or something to their their village or doing like financing their agricultural uh, ventures even better so, like, okay we got four minutes left time to speed run through gradual decentralization and strong micro focus and i actually think that's possible to get like the core points across very quickly um so the point of gradual decentralization, right, is that, and this is kind of, this is what we're talking about a little bit with this vote, and then like the, and, and the, this like the, the idea of like a path and like setting up a path and, and holding that path in the long run, right, and, the, and, and sort of like being able for the community to survive as it grows and retain its core principles. So, so basically the way we can, you know, the way you achieve true decentralization in the long run isn't just by, like decentralization is not the absence of something. It is, like decentralization is not the absence of centralization. It is the, the existence of decentralization, I guess you can say, right? Like if you take a system that's centralized and you remove the centralized element, that doesn't mean it's now decentralized. That just means now there's a power vacuum. Like now there's like a big thing missing. And if you're lucky, you grassroots community will then build up a decentralized infrastructure in that uh, that's the thing you know the, the empty space that's now not there anymore but if you're unlucky someone else will sweep in and just take over the role and maybe those people will not even you know those people will not be aligned with the long-term vision of, of decentralization right so that's kind of what we have the, the way we're thinking in the foundation is that basically we want to make sure that like, the most important thing for us is in the very long run the system always remains decentralized and there should be no chance that like it can go on the path towards decentralization and then one day like this is oh, straight from that path and actually end up in a ditch somewhere ruled by some you know evil centralized actor somehow um is that possible to, to bake that in or is that going to be part of the like, constant diligence to ensure that centralization doesn't get start creeping back in well so i mean 
so our thinking is that what we need is this like step by step approach, right? Where because the pro like because to go back to the problem of the power vacuum, right? Like the, the problem is kind of that if we if the if there's just a big empty space of people who were doing something before and now they aren't anymore, and the community is left there and they don't really have the tools or the knowledge to to take over that role, then I mean, the, the, how are you going to expect something decentralized to grow out of that, right? What we have to do is we have to anytime the foundation takes a step back and sort of reduces its role and its its guidance and, and leadership in the community, it has to have first spent considerable effort to to build up the community and make them even like stronger and even bit like actually so well equipped to when they take over this role, they will take they will do it better than the foundation ever did. Do we have any examples in the crypto space that you'd point to of sort of successful decentralization? Because uh, the, the ones that immediately come to my mind are, have been horrible failures so far. So yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I think the only one is Ethereum at Bitcoin, right? Like, I think Ethereum is probably the best example, right? Of like, um, I mean, I, I, but but that was to a large extent like instant decentralization, right? And that was just, I mean, that was actually what we expected would happen with Maker originally, um, and we spent a but eventually we realized it's just not it just didn't happen like that initial uh spark of like it's just like one overnight suddenly there's a huge community who all like are set up and and sort of embody this decentralized ecosystem mm -hmm. so um basically there's a lot of examples of doing it wrong and not any example of doing it right and most of the doing it wrong examples i think are really based on this like power vacuum thing right uh well, this it, it, we've seen layer example, two Layer, layer two experiments fail almost immediately. Like we have uh, obviously EOS and there's LISC and the, like, well, the list goes on and on and on. So is that one of the reasons why the, it says gradual decentralization instead of immediate decentralization? Like this is going to be a process where we figure it out over the next few years? Yeah, I mean, so the thinking is this, right? I mean, it's about like decentralization is like a point out in the future and it's like a path to getting there, right? And what we want to ensure is that like, what we, we, once we get towards that, moving towards that point, and like, and sort of get to the point, I guess it's like it's kind of like a like you know it's like a energy minima, right? Where like that's where you sort of it, like it's once you're there, it's hard to like get out, right? It takes a lot of energy to when really you have something that's true. Let's say something like Ethereum, right? Something that's truly decentralized. To take that and turn it into something centralized is basically impossible. But but when you, when you're going there on the path there, it's kind of like um, that's when you, especially in the, in the beginning, right? That's when it's easy for you to, to stray to the wrong side. And then the foundation will kind of like do like this, right? And sort of guide the community on that path. And, and as every, like as the community gets stronger and better and we get closer and closer to decentralization, the foundation will sort of like, you know, like guide less and less, but still be there as like the sort of the guarantee that we are still going towards decentralization. And only when it is absolutely guaranteed that we have achieved true decentralization does the foundation completely like step back and, and almost like dissolves itself essentially, right? Like really like completely just becomes a regular member of the community. It'll be fascinating to watch that process. I think that in our space, there's this, people have a tendency to want to have come up with a magic algorithm that will save us. And I think we've seen that algorithms get co-opted uh, almost immediately. So. The interplay yeah. between governance and, and algos over the next couple of years is going to be uh, so awesome. now i so I, I just want to say like i mean that's three or four or five sentences about strong market focus um just because now we just sort of managed to cover gradual decentralization right and just like and also the promise of gradual decentralization is this it will only be steps towards decentralization right there will never be a step back and that's kind of what the foundation really promises and also there will there will always be there will also not be like a stop and just no steps unless it's literally like we're seeing if if we open up more the whole thing will collapse because something right well it like and at that point still that's not even a justifiable i mean the foundation is never gonna like hold you know like hold back on and sort of and, and stop the process of decentralization but it is we are going to do it slowly and carefully and gradually right but always in the right direction so strong market focus, um, the point of that is kind of like, I mean, we've been talking about all this charity, sustainable, blah, 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 you know, like all this like hippie stuff basically. Um, but the thing is actually pretty much all of us are like really hardened businessmen basically who've been doing like entrepreneurs or working in big companies. Um, 
or like, I mean, and, and sort of have this like business market viability mindset, right? And, and kind of that's, I mean, that's another thing we want to really achieve, right? Is that we want to build up like a proper business in using the foundation, right? Like, to, and especially in the short run, sort of like ensure that Maker is a proper business that makes sense in the marketplace. And we will basically stop at nothing to achieve that. I mean, it, adoption and success of Maker is more important than anything else, um, except for some extremely core principles, right? I mean, we will never, we will never like compromise on something like, you know, it should be decentralized or other like fundamental things, right? But other than that, we're not gonna like, you know, you know, like avoid doing something that makes sense from a business perspective because of some like belief that we're better than others, like moral superiority or something. I mean, especially in terms of marketing, right? Where we've really been holding back in the past and that's going to change. I mean, we're going to be a lot more like outward facing and really be like out there and, and acting like a, a business that's trying to survive in the market should do. And we will be really, I mean, we are really good at it, but we are not, we are sort of holding back still and we're going to stop doing that. Um, is that because we're waiting for a multi-collateral or is that for other reasons? Well, it is also just because of the, the identity of the community, right? It's kind of because Maker started off as this like incredibly grassroots principled community, right? And the foundation was the community originally, right? And, but now when we have stuff like the 20% principle and we have this like, we have more clarity around who we are and like what, what our core principles and core, like sort of core ideals are, we don't have to hold back anymore, you know, because there's nothing wrong with killing everyone else in the market, right? Like, and, and dominating all the other stable points. That's totally, that's like a noble thing to do. So that's what we're going to do. Um, and we're doing, going to do that while we also, you know, like save the world with, with charity and uh, sustainable finance, and, you know, all of that stuff. But right. fundamentally, right, we are committed to, to sort of like deliver as a, as a business to the community, right? And like use, uh, you know, like traditional business strategies and tactics and like mindsets and only do some crypto, you know, like new age thinking and, and uh, blockchain community, internet age, you know, stuff when we absolutely know that makes sense, right? We're never going to do like that kind of stuff or like experimental, like new age thing, like thinking, you know, for the sake of doing it because we had, to, you know, because this goes back to like the identity of who we are, right? We are, we are, you know, we like charity, we like decentralization, and then we like success and we're going to achieve that, right? And that's what, that's kind of like the function of the, the foundation. Yes, yeah, well, success is good. And I think that most maker holders will agree with you there. I think that there's a pile of things. I'm really, I really want to start digging into sustainable finance and gradual decentralization specifically, because I think that there's a lot of content there. Um, so it might be a good place to sort of stop today and we'll pick up next week uh, straight off with uh, sustainable finance and the market focus stuff. I think that we're really interested in, in digging into as well, but we're five minutes over the hour. So it's probably a good place to stop today. Uh, thanks Rune for, for joining us again. There's lots of really good information to digest. It's going to take a while to figure that stuff out. <laughs> thanks Jess. Thanks everybody else for showing up. Thank you. Before you guys go, I think uh, Aviva is continuing the chat in a different Google Meet. So if you guys are interested in continuing talking, I think me and him are going to be in there. I don't know who else is joining, but anybody's welcome. We yeah, also understand great. you're very busy, so um, but we, we really love this discussion. So if anyone wants to join, there's no restrictions. Feel free. I posted the link. Uh, thank you all for doing this call. Thanks, Aviva. Uh, why don't you post that in, the, in our chat as well so other people can pop in? Yeah, you want to read it? And great initiative. Uh, I, I, I just I just posted it, but I'll post again just in case. All right. Thanks, everybody. See right. you tomorrow if you're if you're interested in governance, or else next week. See you, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks.